a Living History production. I'm Peter Hart, and for the last 40 years, I've interviewed thousands of veterans about their experience of war. Join me on a journey through the pages of history. Welcome to Peter Hart's Military History. Hello, and welcome to Peter Hart's Military History Podcast. Uh, and I'm here with uh, Gary Bain. My, my, you're my favourite, Gary. And we have a special guest today. We have uh, Fred, the wonderful... Uh, what type of dog is it? He's a Border Collie. Ah, um, he's very old. You can barely tell what he is. Anyway, if you hear any strange panting during this podcast, that is, uh, that is probably Gary, not the, uh, the, not the dog. But uh, we'll, we'll, I'll alert to you if I hear anything. Um, now, what are we talking about today, Gary? What, what, what have you picked for us to ramble on as if we haven't prepared in depth beforehand? Well, today we're talking about Y Beach, Peter, and uh, you know we we've talked about V Beach previously, so I dare say we will get the two confused throughout the morning. Well, I'm just looking at my podcast notes, and it says V Beach podcast <laughs> notes. I was just looking confusedly at that. <laughs> oh God! Um, they, yeah. mm. uh, yes. oh, my proof checkers, my publishers have a great time. Uh, you can imagine that. Uh, yeah, we'll talk about why Beach uh, landed. And, and this is a really interesting one for me uh, because I've been there a few times. Now, you are a well-known... You've got a fear of heights, haven't you? Uh, no, I had vertigo once, Peter, while we were in Gallipoli and never since. And what, what did you have to retrace your steps on Walker's Ridge? I did. <laughs> did. Did Roger have to hold your hand? He did. <laughs> That's Roger Chapman, uh, uh, another guide, a uh, Gallipoli guide, well known, well known for looking after the weak. Well known for proud. holding hands. Well known for holding hands. <laughs> yeah, sorry, Roger. <laughs> I also kissed his seat, as you recall. Oh, right. Well, I don't think we want to go into any of that. Oh, that's after I told you he died. Yes. yes. <laughs> anyway, enough of this uh, merry banter. Uh, let's get on to, to, to something serious, which is the, the Y Beach uh, landing. Now, um, one of. Can you hear that, listeners? <laughs> That's Gary. <laughs> um, the why it's it's often been seen, hasn't it, as a, as a missed opportunity. Uh, you know, if only, if only, I, 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 you know, one of the great what ifs or whatevers or <laughs> of the Gallipoli campaign. Um, so, can I take you back then? So, what what was the plan? So, this is Hamilton's great plan. Where did Y Beach fit into that plan? Well, the overall objective, which. Uh, it, 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 it can't be repeated too often, if I remember the name, is to secure the Kilid Bahir Plateau, which is immediately behind the European forts in the Narrows, the narrowest part of the Dardanelles Straits. The idea was to get so the fleet could pass through the Narrows into the Sea of Marmora and then go and blow hell out of uh, uh, Constantinople, Istanbul now. But the first day objectives was Achibaba, wasn't it? Achibaba, which is a prominent hill in front of Khalid Bahir, but the ground between them is awful. Valleys, ridges and all sorts. But Achibaba dominates the whole of the Hellas Peninsula uh, uh, and, and therefore is crucial. So that was the first day's objective. Right, OK. So, inane question perhaps, was it sensible? No. I mean, uh, I mean, the modern army say that without helicopters, uh, excluding the use of helicopters, they'd have a lot of trouble landing unopposed on the beaches that they have uh, around the bottom of Hellas and getting a formation of troops in battle order to the top of the hill within a single day. That's without any opposition at all. That's just getting ashore in, in those conditions. It, it's a ludicrous plan. Um, so now, can I just say, I've been there a number of times with you. <laughs> I'm going to be really obvious here. My idea of a beach is a gentle slope away from the sea that you can actually cross and, you know, with a bit of hard work, get to the top of. Is that what Y Beach looks like? No. No, it doesn't. No, Y Beach is a an extra. Let, let's look at the plan then. So we'll go through the plan. Um, now, there's a quote from uh, General Sir Ian Hamilton which expresses his thinking well. And I'll just read it for you. Uh, I'm not going to do a posh Scottish accent. Uh, perhaps, no, no, I won't get you to do it either because you've got a not posh. Uh, I would like to land my whole force in one, like a hammer stroke, with the fullest violence of its mass effect, as close as I can to my objective, the Kilid Bahir 
plateau. But apart from the lack of small craft, the thing cannot be done. The beach space is so cramped that the men and their stores could not be put ashore. I have to separate my forces and the effects of momentum, which cannot be produced by cohesion, must be reproduced by the simulta simultaneous nature of the movement. That's a bit posh language, but what he means is he'd have liked to have just done one drive straight for Khalid Bahir, all his troops landing in the same area and then pushing straight forward. But he can't because, as you point out, the beaches are too small and weird and, and not beaches at all for the most part. Hang on a minute. Hang on a minute. <laughs> there are suitable beaches both sides of the Gamma Tepe, for example. You've got Brighton Beach. Uh, that would have been a perfectly acceptable... Suvla would have been a perfectly acceptable beach. I, you've said, you've said to me before that you know that's the first time I've heard that he wanted to concentrate his forces, and I'm going to quote from uh, Grasping Gallipoli by Peter Chateau and Peter Doyle. I believe that's how it's pronounced. Um, this is the day after the landing, so this is the 26th of April, in a paper that was read to the Royal Geographical Society by. The noted archaeologist and expert on the Near East, uh, a guy called Hogarth, uh, D.G. Hogarth. So bear in mind, he could have no idea what was going on at the Gallipoli Peninsula. All the western end of the Gallipoli Peninsula is of broken, hilly character, which combines with lack of water and consequent lack of population and roads to render it an unfavourable area for military operations. No general, if he had the choice, would land a considerable force upon it at any spot below the Narrows. So it was well known that it was unsuitable. And I believe the Navy actually pointed out to the army that it was unsuitable. The, the Navy had been serve, looking round. You know, you can't be too obvious in checking these things because obviously it will uh, show what you're planning to do. So... Uh, uh, are you buzzing, Gary? <laughs> <laughs> no, I've stopped. <laughs> um, but so, I mean, the Navy have gone up and down the coast trying not, not to make things too apparent. Uh, and the, there's great quotes like that. that one quote I remember is, is that they, you know, they they looked at them and uh, wherever they said landings were impossible, the, 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 now the army had decided to land. And another quote, which I like even better, which uh, when, when they said the army said that things, you know, land features weren't on the maps this this naval captain said ha, well of course i've got a copy of this map and to my mind it's all perfectly obvious but then they're army officers and they're not very good at reading maps which is you know good stuff but the thing is it's the modern army and i've been on lots of battlefield tours for the modern army and this is hindsight of course but also it was one of the original plans from from early on was to land everything land the covering force obviously seize the highest ground and then land everybody along the beaches uh, between where the kamatel is just uh, just south of uh, gabatepe uh, through and into uh, you know as far as suvla bay not inside suvla bay because the navy said it would have shoals the army ignored them later in the campaign about that as well and that's a huge long beach where you could land anything you liked you know um but no we decide to go for helis uh we're going to go all around the helis tip there's going to be a landing at anzac cove which uh well it wasn't meant to be there it was meant to be between brighton beach and fisherman's heart uh, you look at a map to see where those are chums and that becomes anza but the main landings were going to be uh, around the Hellas Peninsula. Now, one of them we did in an earlier podcast, which I, I think is already out, on V Beach. Uh, that's in front of the, that's at the very tip in front of Sedobar Fort in the village. W Beach is a little bit further to the, well, I'm terrible at directions, uh, northwesty, but not very far. It's only about half a mile away, just a bit round the Hellas Cape. That's W Beach. And they they could be said to be beaches. They're not great beaches, uh, and they are natural amphitheatres as a great expert once uh, pointed out beaches were uh, natural amphitheatres which 
Yes, well, never mind. Anyway, and then further round uh, is X Beach. That's a little bit further to the north of W Beach. Uh, and that's, you've been there. We've mm. been there. I mean, it's hardly a beach at all. It, 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 it's just not good. And then there's S Beach, which is in the opposite side. You know, it's sort of opposite to uh, X Beach. The other side, actually inside the Dardanelles, in a sense. It's in Morto Bay, isn't it? It's in Morto Bay. Yes, that's right. Um, and that's, that's another landing. Uh, then there's the landing of the French. Then there's diversions here, there, and every bloody where. I mean, the plans are ludicrous. Uh, and then there's the Y Beach landing. Now, the Y Beach landing was um, was it? I, I, I find it's at the bottom of a steep Y-shaped gully. We'll talk more about this later. Uh, and it's further up the western side of the peninsula. About uh, uh, I'm, I've got a room of bloody old distances. Eh? It's about a mile beyond Gully Beach. Yeah, I'd say so. A mile, a, a mile and a half at most uh, north of Gully, uh, Gully Beach, which is in itself. Now that we didn't land there, but that's a little. That's about half a mile beyond X Beach. So it's it's a long way from anywhere else that we're landing. It's on its own. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, we'll talk about the beach later. Um, and it was to act. And this is this. It was to act, it was to disrupt and attract the attention of the Turkish reserves, preventing them from reaching the main things. Now, if you're going to land troops, they've got to be able to do what they said. So the point about this is, if you're going to attract the attention of reserves, you have to be able to cope with the attention of said reserves. So this is an interesting point that we've got to you know you you've got to look at. The overall operations, uh, so Hamilton was the overall commander. The commander, Helles, was, uh, the, and they're the 29th Division plus the Plymouth Battalion. Uh, they were, that was Major General Aylmer Hunter Weston, who is a, a, an unbelievable character, uh, arouses much, much hatred amongst Gallipoli people and some people. And, uh, I mean, uh, a strange man, highly intelligent, uh, 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 insensitive to the point of brutishness. Um, and I believe we're going to be doing a podcast on him later. We, we hope to. Because, well, we've been asked to, and I think it's a good idea because the contradictions, you know, just because you're intelligent, you know, it's like some academics, just because they're intelligent doesn't mean they know it all. Although they all think they do. Uh, but, well, no, that's untrue, isn't it? Most of them. I do apologise to any academics who don't think they know it all. Except those from Yorkshire from an earlier podcast. Yes. <laughs> oh, they can sort of... <laughs> Down with Yorkshire is the roof. You know, we get, we've got to keep that going. Um, so um, the the, the uh, Hunter Weston is interesting. You know, he, he intelligent but acts stupidly at times, uh, insensitive, and 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 he is put in charge of 29th Division, and he's focused. He's focused on the main landings, W and V Beach. Y Beach is very much a pet scheme of uh, Hamilton. So why doesn't he take direct control of, of things himself? Why, why have Hunter Weston do it? That's because in those days, generals had the idea. They used to say, describe it as the, the, an army or, a, you, know, a, you know, a force was like uh, you, uh, you point it in the direction and you fire the weapon. Fire and forget. And you forget. Well, not not forget yet, but yes, yeah. That basically, it's then under the command of the local commander, and you're not to interfere. They've been told what to do. They get it. You don't interfere, you know. And this is a continual problem through the story of Y Beach. You know, it, it, it is a. Uh, I'm I'm really glad you raised that. But it's not the so there is a problem between the fact the person who planned it, the person who's most interested in. It, <laughs> Those tiny footsteps were Fred, the uh, border collies. Uh, it, the person who planned it or, or, or insisted on the planning was not the person interested who was carrying out the plan. His interest is on V and W, the main landings. Hunter Weston, that's his preoccupation. Now, um, who who is landing at Y Beach? Well, it's uh, this is interesting. It's uh, it's two battalions essentially. It's the Plymouth Battalion from the Royal Naval Division. Uh, so the Jolly Jack Tars, as we uh, like to think of them, under the command of Colonel Geoffrey Matthews. And then as well, there was the first King's Own Scottish Borderers. And uh, they, they were on the KOSB. I often will refer to them uh, uh, under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Archibald Coe. Both these colonels were under the impression that they were the senior officer. This is a staggering piece of military incompetence. You cannot have two battalions landing on a beach 
and thinking that they're both in command of the operation. In fact, Matthews was meant to be in command, despite the fact that the others are a regular battalion and, they, and the, the Plymouths are a fairly dodgy bunch. Um, uh, he's given... And, and Matthews has given no distinct, definite written orders and, and a, a series of imprecise verbal blatherings uh, is how I would characterise it, which is me putting a layer of modern language on it. He was told to land at this so-called beach, again, we'll come back to the beach, uh, to move inland to threaten any Turkish withdrawal from the glorious advance from VNW Beach, because they, of course, presumed that they'd be la advancing swiftly towards Achi Baba. So they would interfere, uh, interfere with their, their, the Turkish withdrawal. They were to capture a gun that was rumoured to be in the area, although they never found it and no one really knows where it is. And they, uh, the third part I mentioned earlier, attract Turkish attention and resources away from the main landings. Uh, so that's what they're meant to do. He was also told to get in touch with X Beach, that's the one uh, further along, but wasn't told why or what he was to do. Was it a, a signal? Or was it to actually join up with them? Uh, he was not told what to do if the main body didn't advance from uh, W and V Beach. And uh, it's just it's just shit. You know, it's that's blunt, you know, talk. But, I mean, it's not the way to... I mean, staff work, and that, this is staff work, isn't it? This is uh, command and control, staff work. It's just... And what size of defending force were they anticipating well this is a problem they think there's a whole turkish division uh defending this area but there's not <laughs> i mean that would explain most of it um let, let me go through it um the, the forced landing at y beach is bigger than all the turkish defenders put together all of them what, for the whole, for the whole, the whole of the Hellas Hellish. Peninsula. So uh, let me go through it. There's no gap. There's nobody above Y Beach at all. Uh, why would there be? Again, come back to that. We're keeping you in suspenders there, aren't we? You, know, you look nice in suspenders, by the way. I, I was going to mention it earlier. Thank you. Uh, you made an effort for us today, I see. Um, the, the, so there's uh, one platoon, uh, sorry, two platoons of the 2nd 26th Regiment uh, at Gully Beach. Uh, right, uh, we don't we don't attack there. One platoon to the north, further north of Y Beach. So, uh, sorry, Gully Beach is to the south. Um, of, so, uh, I'm afraid Fred's just farted. <laughs> oh dear. Oh well, we'll carry on through the pain and suffering. What we give up for you lot? Why have we got the dog in here with us? <laughs> well done, Fred. It was either the dog or Janet. <laughs> <laughs> oh god anyway uh, where were we uh, so uh, so there's one platoon to the north uh, the gully beach is to the south to the north of y beach is a hill called sari tepe which is about level just beyond uh, to the left and beyond the uh, of uh, krithia uh, alci tepe as it is now and there was a, a platoon there uh, and so you know the main turkish reserve the, which three battalions of the 25th regiment are 5 miles to the uh, to the northwest at Seraphim Farm, which is actually nearer. That's, that's basically all just by the uh, Khalid Bahia Plateau. They're a long way away. You know, they're not going to be there anytime soon. So, um, you see, what you've got here is you've got two battalions, the Plymouths, the Kings and Scottish Borders, and, oh, well, the Company of South Wales Borders must have get the Welsh there. You know, oh, we did beat them at rugby recently. Now oh, they, 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 they'll, they'll love that. They had to cite half our team for gross cheating after the match, but never mind. We still won, eh, Gary? <laughs> um, and um, so, um, where, where are we? Yeah. So that, so th this is all there is. You know, one battalion basically, and then f you know, four battalions, three battalions, sorry, as reserves a long way away. You know, that's all they're facing. Um, anyway. What happens on the actual landing? So uh, the, the landings, uh, they start off at uh, 4.45 in the morning. 04.45, quarter to five to you, Gary. Thank you. <laughs> I knew that would confuse you from certain missed appointments in the past. And they're approaching the beach. And they're all in their usual way. So they're being, they have a little mo uh, motorboat, tows them in, and then they row the rest of the way. Uh, they don't have a preliminary bombardment because... What is it to bombard? You know, it's a cliff, basically. And this is the point. They're rowing in, and it's a bloody cliff. Now, it's just a cliff. 
<laughs> and they row in here, row de row row. There's no garrison at all, no garrison at all. And Daniel Joyner is the per- person we're going to quote most. Uh, 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 I quote him a lot in my book, X insert advert. It's by me, and it's called Gallipoli, because I have no imagination. Uh, buy it, folks. It's great. <laughs> oh. uh, anyway. Uh, What's Dan- it about? <laughs> you bastard. <laughs> anyway, uh, Daniel Joyner is, uh, is uh, the chap. He's, uh, he's, his account is in the Imperial War Museum, and it's great. And he says this. No beach. They're rowing in. No beach was visible. It appeared as if the cliffs ran into the sea. We imagined that the boat would go nearly to the beach. A rude awakening awaited us. The water was quite clear. We began to notice shelves of rock. About 30 to 40 yards from the beach, our boat grounded. Grounded. (laughs) Grounded. Grounded. For a fraction of a second, we were at a loss. Not so, however, those in the know. As soon as the boat touched out, they jumped into the water. No further order was necessary before we realised what had happened. We, before we realised what would happen. The English language is a stranger to me at times. Before we realised what had happened, we were waist deep. Instead, however, of the water getting shallower, it got deeper. The sea is a mysterious thing. The smaller men having a difficult job to keep their collars dry. <laughs> the footing was uncertain. The bed was in layers, some higher than others. Floundering was frequent. Uh, and when it is taken into account the weight we were carrying, floundering was not a joke. Our rifles were often submerged in our attempts to regain our balance. Now, uh, you used to soldier. Uh, do you think salt water is good for rifles or not? Clean no, them? not. But also, so I've got a couple of questions there. So they're carrying... What sort of weight are they carrying? Carrying normal stuff. Uh, so they're carrying battle order, which uh, normally, in any time, ta- they always whine about how much to carry. But by the time you have to carry things, they've got about 80 pounds on them, you think. And the uniforms are presumably thick woolen uniforms. Yes. Which retain water. Yes. The car- Salt water. Yes. <laughs> and you've then got to climb a cliff. <laughs> I see what you're getting at. You're thinking of saw... Saw everything. Crevices. <laughs> Saw everything. So, so not only are you carrying eighty pounds, you're in the water, and uh, you know it, it's it's just you're approaching a cliff. Now, I, I, you know, I've come across a, 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 I think this is a limerick by one of the uh, Scottish borderers, which I'll read if I may. I think it was Jack Churchill, but it's always attributed to him. Yeah. Jack Churchill. Any relation? I think he was a second cousin, twice removed, probably. To Jack. Um, so it goes something like this. Why beach the Scottish borderer cried, panting up the steep hillside. Why beach? To call this thing a beach is stiff. It's nothing but a bloody cliff. Why beach? Fantastic. You see, that is the only form we, we, I mean, Poetry Corner is going to be a fairly regular part of these podcasts due to our mutual love of poetry. And I thought that was a particularly uh, emotional reading there. Thank you. Um, now I want to point out that I mean, we wouldn't normally joke too much about a landing, uh, but at this stage, it's going as well as can be expected. Well, it's completely unopposed. With a cliff in front of you. So actually, the problem is physical. And I have been there. I've climbed down into it. I always take them down the bluff at the uh, the uh, northern end because that's terrifying. And then there is actually an easier way up through one of the Y-shaped gullies because it's basically a Y-shaped gully. Two gullies joined into one. And... Um, it's quite. It, it is bloody steep, and uh, it you can hurt yourself if you fall off if you choose to. Best not. You, know. you and I have both been off at the top of pluggies, and it, that's quite steep. Is it worse than that? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'll be going down the ravine then. <laughs> <laughs> the back of pluggies is my secret route. <laughs> Uh, fortunately, they've now cut steps uh, to make it unnecessary, but I might still take them down. Uh, that's to get over to uh, uh, Brid- uh, not Bridges, uh, Bronze Hill. Bronze Hill, I love Bronze Hill. Anyway, I'm getting distracted. I'm so easily distracted, aren't I? Anyway, this is uh, Joyner says this. Daniel Joyner says this, the King's Own Scottish Border. He said, uh, <laughs> all he had to do was get up this cliff. No enemy. And it's easier said than bloody done. Um, he said, well, <laughs> just take the bit. <laughs> this was easier said than done, curses. <laughs> we started. No attempt at order was made, nor was it expected. Hand over hand, a pull up here, a jump there, and so on. Seemingly, the Turks did not know we had landed. If they had, well, that is a different story. One boy scout on the top of the 
cliffs could have kept 50 men down there with chucky stones. So treacherous was the foothold. So it just means if you stood on the top, yeah. just threw bricks down at them. You, you know, you don't need bloody weapons almost. You can just, you know, it, it's it, it's ridiculous. So they climb up to the top. And when you get to the top, you're on something called Gully Spur. There's uh, basically, the, the Hellas is five spurs. And this is the first spur. And then just across, about a quarter of a mile away, is Gully Ravine. So Gully Spur, you're on Gully Spur. Gully Ravine's in front of you. Gully Ravine's between you and the next spurs and between you and Krithia, or Al Sitepe, as it's known now. Now, um, when they got that, they didn't really know what to do. You know, there's a lack of command and control. Some of them wander out to the southeast. Uh, uh, you know, um, the, some of them cross the gully. They they they, they go looking for Krithia. Uh, some of them some of them go some of them go looking for the artillery gun as well. They don't find anything. Uh, there's always this rumor, you know, that some actually got to Krithia. Uh, and then and then some of them uh, look for the X speech, but it's a bit too far to be bothered with, it, and they never actually get anywhere. And they don't. And they don't actually do anything so why don't they actually advance towards either the beaches or Krithia why don't they do that well the thing is Krithia is just a it, I mean it becomes an obsession and people say oh some ambulance men were in Krithia or oh a Scottish border or Plymouth was in Krithia as if it mattered Krithia no disrespect to the village it's just a poxy little village it has no importance at all. It is it's just there were later three battles of Krithia, followed, followed by, we, we started calling by dates after that because we, we recognised we weren't ever going to get it, I think. And the point is, it is just a village. So would it have mattered even if they had advanced? No, uh, not really, because the thing is, they, they were scared. I mean, this... I, they weren't scared's the wrong word, isn't it, Gary? Uh, they were cautious because they thought there was a division of Turkish troops in the area. So why didn't they dig in then? Ah, well, that is inexcusable because if you're not, if you're scared and you don't know what you're doing, what you don't do is sit around with your thumb up your ass. I mean, you 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 you, you just got to do something. Um, now I understand that they didn't want to move to the right to establish start, to, to establish contact with X Beach because if you turn south, you're turning your back on the possible enemy coming from the north, i.e., and that's where the reserves were, the first twenty fifth at Seraphim Farm. Uh, so I understand that as perfectly sensible. I understand why they don't go charging across Gully Ravine because you and I have walked up Gully yeah. Ravine many times. Yeah. It's not a small ravine, is it? No, it, it could be two or three hundred feet deep. Um, it's steep, uh, and it's difficult. And it's overlooked. It's oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, so um, exploit. So what should they have done? You know, I mean, I, I don't know what they should have done. They should have had better orders. They should uh, perhaps, if they don't know what they're doing, mm. why were they were there in the first place? Why do you land a force and then you have no plan for them? Oh, I, I don't know. Anyway, so. The confusion between Co, Colonel Co, and Colonel Matthews is also ongoing. Now, but do you know what? I don't think that's the real issue. The real issue is um, the, the at higher level. And so Hamilton's quite interested in his pet project. Oh, well, I thought of that. I'm so clever. I've thought of that. That's childish version. Uh, sorry, I've upset the dog now with that. Uh, probably thinks he's going for a walk. As long as I don't mention the word walk, we'll be all right. Uh, anyway, but um, I, I'm sure he didn't behave like a 14-year-old girl, as I just mimed. Uh, but but uh, Hamilton was interested, and he said, he sent a message, a wireless signal. He was off uh, Anzac, uh, um, Hamilton was. He sent a wireless signal, said, Would you like to get some more men ashore at Y Beach? If so, trawlers available. This is the man who said there was no small... You know, hmm. this was apparently impossible before. Yeah. And uh, notice, notice, this is important. And it's what you said earlier, or what we said earlier. He asked. He didn't order. That is not how you said it. I mean, what he should have said is either nothing or get some bloody men ashore at Y Beach now. I'm sending trawlers. Get your finger out. Hmm. Do you see what I mean? But he didn't. He said... I say, awfully, do you mind, well, possibly, would you, would you like, well, what does, <laughs> meanwhile, there's Hunter Weston, he's down at the other end, his men, they've had the 
awful fight at W Beach. There's a slaughter going on at V Beach, uh, and they haven't even got a shore. You know, the whole plan's gone tits up. It, it utterly, utterly going to hell. What do you think he's concentrating on? B and B and W. So what's the so what's the navy doing? You know, they're, well, they're, they're basically completely unnecessary because there's no opposition to the landing. They can't support something that's not. At Y Beach, you mean? No, there's nothing much they can do because it's difficult. I mean, they can get an angle to to hit people on the spur. But so what did they have offshore? They had a couple of cruisers. It, I, I don't know. Uh, yes. Is the answer, and 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 other ships could say it's not far for them to sail up and, and provide some backing. But at the moment, there's nothing to shoot at. Exactly, and so, 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 they're so the navy can't really do much about it. Um, Hunter Weston, he's obsessed by this time with W and B Beach. We we do get our V's and W's mixed up, and uh, and I apologise for it all that. We we're all we're both doing it occasionally. Um, to be uh, fair, I don't. It's really just you. Size patiently. <laughs> Cad and bounder, um, so he um, he's obsessed with, with V and W, and and he sends when he's asked this, uh, he he says that uh, changing plans would simply delay um, the landing. But but to uh, a degree, he's right. Uh, you know, he should have been obsessed with V Beach. That's where it was happening, and that's where the support was. Needed. And W Beach, yeah, that is where they're the main landings. That's where you're meant to get three, four, five, six battalions ashore, not with a bloody cliff in front of you. Of course, he's obsessed with that, yeah. and of course, he's going. You can imagine him getting the telegram from, <laughs> and you can just imagine what he says. Oh, for God's sake, that bloody Hamilton, Jesus, you know, and the rest of it. So. Nothing, nothing's good. So he basically, what he's done is said, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you don't say yeah, 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 you know, but in teenage fashion, yeah, yeah, yeah. Meaning no. <laughs> Can't be bothered. Anyway, so what happens next? Right. Um, eventually, 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 so nothing happens all day. And eventually they start trying to dig up, dig in, dig in. Dig up, take a while. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm making no progress with this digging up. <laughs> Dig in. Um, so they try. They start digging in, but it's it's all going to hell. They've left it too late. They don't have pick, and the earth, as you know, there is hard mm -hmm. and unyielding at times. You you need pickaxes and uh, proper you know uh, spades and things, and they've got the entrenching tools. And this is what Major Alfred Welsh, first KOSB, says: the line was formed formed by the men's packs and with entrenching tools. It never reached what could be called a trench and was constructed under a most harassing and ever-increasing rifle fire. Although never a serious menace, bursts of gunfire, sniping and threats had accompanied the construction of our frail fort. Now, who are these? Yes, who are they? Well, the Seraphim farm people haven't arrived. These are the people from Gully Beach. They've moved. They've seen the landing at X Beach. They've seen the landing at Y Beach. They're in between and like, all sensible soldiers sod this for a game soldiers. <laughs> They've moved back and moved to take up sniping positions facing Y Beach. Uh, and so that's who these people are that's shooting at them. Uh, it carries on for the rest of the day. Turkish snipers are good. We have this thing about British rifle skills that we're the only country in the world that can shoot straight. Uh, our, our, our regulars are well-trained riflemen, 15 rounds a minute and many more aimed but Turkish snipers are very good. They soon got a reputation of being able to shoot through a loophole in a sniper's plate. Uh, you know, they could, they, they, you know, they, to hit, hit. they were fabulous. And it's so, a recurring theme throughout other landing areas. And, it is. Uh, always the same. And, and they go for officers as well, of course, because yeah. you could recognise officers then because they've got a, yeah. they've got all the stuff on their sleeves and the brain and they're wearing dip. Officers wear lighter coloured uniforms. You, you might as well stick a bloody great signpost next to them. Anyway... So, night's falling. The trench is about 18 inches deep with packs and stuff, as Welsh says. Um, they, 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 the Turks then begin to arrive from, uh, from Seraphim Farm. These are the reserves that we are meant to attract and delay and rest. Well, we soon came to regret that because they also bring up a couple of guns by report. I'm, I don't know where these guns come from, so I want to stay vague on that. Uh, and this is what... Uh, um, uh, 
Daniel Joyner says, The shrapnel was getting annoying. The high explosive, dangerous. The bullets, dangerous. The sun hot. The throat dry. The water in our bottles, precious and warm. The stomach needed food. And the eyes of many refused to remain open. Some of us even tried to make some tea. Ah, the British Army. <laughs> but no sooner was smoke seen than the bullets began to splutter. No need now for the NCOs to shout as on manoeuvres. Keep your head down! As the sun went down, the heat of the day changed to a very chilly night. It is bloody cold in April on Gallipoli. Uh, you know, um, now, as a troop, the 1st 25th Regiment from Seraphim Farmer started to arrive and they start to put in their first attacks. Um, there's, the, the, there's meant to be a counterattack about 1740 and Private John Vickers of the Plymouth. Basically, they've taken up shape. The, the Kings and Scottish borders are in the middle. And they've got elements of the Plymouth on the left and right. And they're basically at the top of the cliffs surrounding the Y-shaped gully, Y Beach. OK, and uh, John Vickers says that shortly after the snipers made their appearance, the order was passed out along the line. A large body of troops advancing over the skyline. The message was followed by another, a larger body of troops advancing over the skyline. <laughs> they were 800 to, 800 to 900 yards away, advancing in massed formation, shouting and waving their rifles above their heads. We opened fire upon them. They still rushed on until the two cruisers who were supporting us, HMS Goliath and HMS Dublin, there's the answer to your question, which Thank I you. didn't know earlier, each fired a broadside which completely scattered them. Still daylight. Navy can see him advancing because the spur you've been on that spur. Yeah. It's a spur that leads up to the Yuri Yamot uh, Memorial, uh, and it's open. Um, darkness fell. Now the naval guns can't see them. You know, and if you can't see them, it, you know, uh, the Turks take up their positions about six hundred yards away. And they, they and here's uh, Vickers again, John Vickers, Plymouth. He said uh, shortly after dark they made their first charge as we expected. They came up within ten yards of our trench, but by keeping up a rapid fire we held them back. They retired for a short time, but there's a regular hail of bullets hitting the parapet of the of the trench and almost blinding us with the dirt. The dirt was also getting into the mechanism of our rifles, which added to the difficulty of keeping up a ra rapid fire. Remember, they'd also been in salt water. Yeah. Um, the noise was all. Awful. Well, wounded, groaning and calling for stretchers, which never came. Why, why wouldn't the stretchers come? Well, because it's up a cliff. That's it. The incessant rattle of the machine guns and rifles. That would be our machine guns. Although the 1st 25th may have had some. I know the 1st 26th didn't. The wounded and dying Turks in front calling for Allah. To make matters more cheerful, it began to rain. <laughs> I love these quotes. Now, um... That Daniel Joyner's also remembers it, and 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 this is uh, they, they they launch a sort of, you know little charge, and Daniel Joyner says Cantr Captain Antrobus called the charge. The gr the ground we had to cover was fairly level, covered with the Gallipoli characteristic gorse, <laughs> and the air was laden with lead fired from both flanks. We went at it full tilt. The fire of our supporting flank companies sounded as if each man had a machine gun. The troops, seeing we meant business, hastily withdrew. Yes, because they're not stupid. You know, and we have this idea there's thousands of them and that we're bravely fighting them back. There's actually less Turks moving up to attack them than there are defenders. How many do we think? About 1,500-ish? Yeah, 15, 1,600 uh, Turks they attract to that area. So best part of two battalions. So it's almost equal, but so it's, they're not massive. Did the Turks miss an opportunity? Could the Turks have literally have pushed them off the cliff? That's what they're trying to do. And uh, but But, you know... They're, they're the same number or slightly less, and it's difficult, it, it, you know. But um, but our lads are, are getting desperate because they're frightened. They think there's thousands of Turks out there. And was there, for the benefit of our good friend, um, Mr Thompson, was the logistics in place? Were they getting supplies? Did they have water, ammunition? I'm so glad you've mentioned logistics. You're thinking of Roy Thompson. The Rod No, I'm Rod thinking of Rob Thompson. Rob Thompson yeah. I don't Roy, know Roy Thompson. Roy Thompson's his cousin. I, I think he's a much better logistician. I mean, he just, <laughs> he's, he's but, much better looking. Is he, well, yes. He, yes. Uh, so, yes, uh, this is dedicated to you, Roy. <laughs> Uh, but old Rob then, all right. But uh, but no, they, they, how do you get the ammunition up that bloody cliff? Exactly. I mean, it, it comes in dirty, great big boxes, and they're heavy. How do you get water? What's the world's worst thing to carry? Water. That's a ludicrous thing to say, but you know what I mean. It's um, difficult. Uh, you, you've got to. You're trying to get. You've got people to get down there. The wounded to get down. Uh, it. It's just 
difficult. And Everything. when they get them down, are they getting the wounded away? Are they getting them out to the yeah, ships? Yeah, the, the Navy. The Navy will. will uh, but that gets more and more difficult. Uh, so everything they needed at the top had to be brought up the bloody cliff. And so the logistics are a nightmare. And that's after everything has been brought from the ships to the shore. It's a nightmare. Joyner starts to realise that the, it's getting desperate. He says, the fire from the Turks was now increasing every moment. No guns could support us as our position was so uncertain. We hardly knew where we were. How can the Navy fire support bombardments in the dark when they don't know where anyone is? No, they can't. Uh, 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 our only consolation was in fact that our bayonets were kept ready and would account for something before we said bust. Yeah. Brave lads, they're going to fight to the end. About midnight, not an officer or men except expected to see daylight again. Men were going mad, uh, others groaning, others prompted by the officers were conversing about cheerful topics to drive away the thoughts that, that were rapidly becoming facts and reality. And they just, you know, Talk about anything. Talk about the, the pubs you like. Right? Just anything rather than the Turks that are surrounding you. You know, uh, I'm sure the Turks are doing the same thing. Turks are probably thinking, oh, God, I've got to attack them again. You and know? unless you go back down the cliff, you're there. Yeah. You know, you're stuck. Well, behind you is that awful cliff. You yeah. know, uh, uh, well, when I say cliff, it's very, it's cliffs in places. It's extremely steep and cliff-like. Mm. Uh, right, um, we made some attempt to improve our cover, scraping with our fingers and feet. In, in some cases, one man was holding as much as 25 to 50 yards, the remainder being held by dead men. And they were losing casualties that, that you know. Now, the Turks get close, close enough to be able to use their secret weapon. And what do you think that was? Well, I know, for example, that they had hand grenades, so I'm assuming you mean hand grenades. Just, you're right. And we didn't have them. Why did we not have hand grenades? <laughs> well, we just hadn't... We, we weren't ready for trench warfare. We just didn't have them. On the Western Front, they'd started making them uh, jammed in bombs and things in December. But, you know, this is April. Mm. And we just haven't got hand grenades. But the problem with this is that... You know, what better weapon is there in, a, in a, an approach in the dark than to sneak up and throw hand grenades? Or bombs, as they call them then. It's confusing to the modern ear. They're grenades. Uh, and, and this is what Joyner says, Daniel Joyner. They couldn't respond in kind because they haven't got any. So he says, the bombs came over thick and fast. Those that fell short threw the dirt in our eyes. Those that fell over set fire to the gorse. Not only did the thoughts of being burned alive cause us to take action, but the flare, be the, the, bl the flames being behind us, the Turks opened fire whenever a glare-lit target appeared. We could not retaliate in kind. Firstly, we had no bombs, and also the position we were in would not allow us of charging or firing at the bombers effectively. As the bombs burst, so men crawled out and put out the flames. So all night they're doing this. This is going on all night, and it, it, the fighting, I mean, I, I've been there and stood where those trenches were, and it's it's quite chastening to think of, of what those lads suffered. Because, you know, it's not all V Beach, it's not all W Beach. There, there's things going on. Then about 7 o'clock on the 26th, next day, um, th there's a final desperate attack by the Turks. Why is that the last attack, do you think? Daylight, presumably. And what happens in daylight? The Navy can support them. Well, <laughs> I mean, the Navy are waiting and ready. Uh, our rifles got hot. Wounded men were, were loading. Officers getting us ammunition. What little could be got. There you are, the logistics again. You know, it's, it was impossible to miss. It, it was also impossible to last. Something had to give way. It was us. We retried, dropping back about 50 yards. Our remaining officers rallied us and we charged. The Turks were dumbfounded. They turned and ran for it. We tried to hold again, but again we were forced back. Back and forward we swayed until the Turks had us on topmost edge of the cliffs with a sheer drop of 300 feet. Now, in places they were literally cliffs. Hmm. In other places, there's the ravines. This, this is, you know... and. If you've got a cliff behind you, what are you going to do? So they're just swaying about backwards and forwards, desperate fighting. The Turks had, and this is Joyner again, the Turks had the chance of a lifetime. Another push, we would have been over the cliffs. We, oh, we had turned at bay. Every man that could hold a rifle was brought into the line. Holding like this, we waited for our, the last push. No sooner had the Turks shown a hesitation than our remaining officer grasped the situation and ordered the charge. This time everything was in the mix. Bayonets, butts, fists, feet, in fact everything and anyhow. So mad was the rush, the Turks gave way. We got them right back over the to the position we'd held all night. So they re-get this last desperate counterattack. 
but it might not have worked. I mean, they'd have been off, a lot of them. Both sides utterly exhausted. Daylight. Turks aren't going to do anything. What's going to happen next? Well, the, the answer is that it's all a complete farce. There is total confusion everywhere. Down on Y Beach, people are trying to get off. Uh, there's messages going backwards and forwards uh, from to, uh, for, to 29th Division headquarters from Colonel Matthews saying, whoa, 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 whoa. that's translation for what should we do now? What's going on? What, why haven't you advanced? You know, uh, Hunter Weston ignores it. Basically, he's still got his eyes. Remember, they, mm. they, they haven't taken anywhere at B Beach. W Beach, they've got well, a quarter of a mile. You know, it's, it, um, these, the whole point is that uh, these landings are too far apart to support each other. And it's even better shown that, that the, him, Hamilton's on the Queen Elizabeth. But he's giving support fire to the Anzacs. So he's 15 miles away. It's all a disaster. It's all a disaster. As the night, towards the end of the night, there's various alarmist messages coming from the shore. Not, not necessarily from the, the officers, but, you know, they need to evacuate the wounded. Now, we all understand that. You, yep. you, that you've got to get them off. Um, and what's happening is there's confusion. And they start based, an evacuation sort of starts all on its own. So you mean an evacuation not only of the wounded, but some of the the men who oh, brought right. them down, and uh, uh, and this is Joyner. He's still at the top of the cliffs, and he's going. The snipers were busy as each boat approached and left the cover of the cliffs. The wounded had to go through the water up to their necks in order to reach the boats. Others who were being carried after getting a ducking as the carriers lost their balance. Imagine the conditions of some blinded, some minus a leg, others a foot or, a, or an arm, etc. Our battleships were now pounding away at the enemy. We were to advance no more, so they were able to fire without fear of hitting us. So now the Navy's in force, firing at the troops. Well, it's firing at nothing because Turks are outside. They're, they're probably hiding in Gully. Probably. Uh, I don't know. They're probably hiding in Gully Ravine, you know, which is not far, four or five or six hundred miles away. Um, this, without decision... Why Beach is going to be evacuated? So was there actually an order to evacuate? Not, not at that stage. No, it's it's just happening bit by bit. There's people just, you know, uh, Private Vickers. We had heard from him before. He says the order to retire was passed from the right of the line. We retired to the extreme edge of the cliffs, but as we were short of both stretchers and bearers, some of our wounded were left in the trench. We made a counterattack, driving back their snipers. On regaining our trenches, we find they'd, they, that they had bayoneted our wounded. Three Scotties near to me were in a state of semi-consciousness through loss of blood. They'd all been bayoneted through the chest. We got all the wounded away, and not a second too soon. Uh, troops always think the worst of their enemy. It, it's absolutely natural, you know, and uh, they were, the, the wounded were probably resisting when the Turks bayoneted. But also, the British... Don't take many prisoners at this stage of the campaign. It's just, it's not good or bad or clever, but wounded, everybody just tends to get killed in these actions. They're, they're, war is vicious. Um, Private Joyner seems to be one of the last to go. He's at the top and he says, by this time, as the wounded and stores have been taken off, or all the wounded and stores have been taken off, by prearranged signal, we dropped out of the Turk site below the crest. Many were injured by falling down the cliffs. We were now out of view, but the Turks must have got a shot. No sooner had we got clear, the battleships opened fire at the top of the cliffs and intervening ground, and so made it practically impossible for the Turks to follow us. Other ships took up the fire until we'd all got to the waiting boats. So it was all over by about, well, there's different times, 11.30. I've seen also 1, 2 o'clock, you know, uh, but uh, it's completed. Any 1,300 or 1,400. Oh, I do apologise. Yes, yes, I, yes. All right, all right. Um, what is it? I mean, any brief opportunities that existed were, were, were just lost. Now, why were they lost? Uh, because no one knew what they were doing. Complete failure of command and control. And this is endemic at Gallipoli. It's all over the place all the time at Gallipoli. It's just what happens. Um, what should they have done? What would you have done? What would you have done? Would you have advanced on uh, Krithia? Would you have advanced to X Beach, which also was doing bugger all, by the way, at this time? Would you have marched to the sound of the guns behind V Beach? I think, it, I think it's much simpler than that. Would you have done it in the first place? I mean, did it affect anything? Did it have any impact on any of the outcomes at all? No. And, and it, you know, and actually, they, when they say this, why didn't they 
land march towards the sound of the guns at V Beach. Well, why not land them at X Beach, which is a lot bloody dearer in the first place, or W Beach? What? Why land them in a ludicrous place? If you can't deal with the counterattacks from the Turks, why are you there? You know, what are you trying to do? Hamilton was unaware when he found out what was happening. He offered a French brigade to land at, at Y Beach, but by then it had already been evacuated. And he then is mortified. You know, when he, by the time he, he sails up into Queen Elizabeth, see what's going on. And he, it, says, it says him and his staff felt sick with disappointment, his pet project. But it was a stupid, bloody idea. You know, a lot of the credibility comes because later on, that Y Beach position and those trenches become t a Turkish fortification. And in our attacks in first and second Krithia, <laughs> first two battles for Krithia, um, it's a fortress and causes a lot of ca ca but a lot of casualties. But people always say, well, we should have kept it. We tried to keep it. And we couldn't we keep it. That's the point. That is the whole point. So what's achieved? Nothing. Uh, estimates that they diverted 1,600 troops from the main beaches, but we had 700 casualties from the 2,000 men in the So it diverted 1,600 of theirs, it diverted 2,000 of ours, of which 600 became casualties. Um, it, 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 the, the main thing that I would note is, firstly, um, Hunter Weston has no flexibility. I, I think he's right, actually, but he will not send people yeah i don't i don't think he's wrong no, I, I think he, he he no inclination not to concentrate on v and w the main landings uh, not particularly interested in x and s either he's interested in the main landings and uh, his main thing is to original thing strong landing at hellas and advance towards achibaba and and this pet project to do what it, it, it's just an irritation to him but you know hamilton's ridiculous as well I mean, if he wants to do something, why doesn't he take control? Why doesn't he force? He can issue orders. His idea you shouldn't intervene except in the direst emergency meant he was unable to act. You know, when it, the only way he could have forced Hamill, uh, Hunter Weston to do it was by ordering him. And you could argue this was a dire emergency. You know, men were dying. Um, and I think at that time, I don't think it was a, 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 a tactical um, requirement to take Y Beach, but as you say, later in the campaign, it became more. T uh, it would have been nice. Important. But can I ask you this, Gary? Think about this. Do you think they could have held no. the next night? No. You know, they could hold that day. I think they were very lucky to hold the first night. Actually, I think um, it would have only have got worse. The logistical problems would have got worse, and you hit the nail on the head. I think you know the the bombing bombs would have made a hell of a difference the next night. It would. Well, why beach? It's nothing but a bloody cliff. And I hope people have enjoyed that. And uh, it, it's, a, it's a fascinating place to visit. But don't go without a qualified Turkish guide to, so that if you break your leg, you can ring for help. And I'll finish with this, Pete. Why? 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 Beach. Beach. <laughs>